Okay, our saw is almost complete, and one of the last things we need to do now is actually sharpen the saw. And sharpening saws is not nearly as difficult as you think it might be. It's, it does take practice to get, to get really pretty teeth, but to get good sharp teeth, you'll generally get it on your first or second try. So don't worry, don't get too hung up on saw sharpening. It's a fairly easy task, it just takes a little practice. Uh, you are gonna need a few things before you get started though. Uh, number one, you're gonna need a good, a good vise. Uh, but this is a wooden one that I make, and there's a bunch of different metal ones on the market as well. Um, protractors are nice when we're setting up some of the angles. Obviously, we're going to need some files to do the work with, and I'll talk to you about those in a minute, the different sizes and such. And we're going to need what's called a saw set, and those are handy for what we're going to do is we're going to take the teeth and just take, make every other one splay out a little bit. And the reason why we're doing that is we're going to create enough room so that our saw plate will have clearance or the, the tooth line will be a little bit fatter, and then the saw, place, saw plate will be able to just go through the wood without, getting, without grabbing. And last of all, we have what's called jointers. Uh, these, I've got a little simple wooden one here. This is the kind I've been using for years. This is a factory-made one, and they both work equally as well. And what they're designed to do is just level the tops of the tooth. They're gonna, now straight off my retoother, I know my tooth line is pretty good. But if we're rehabbing an old saw that's been sharpened several times, you go on a level every other tooth, just, and all it does is just knocks the tops of the teeth down the high ones, and then you bring them all down to the lower ones. Because one of the worst things about poorly sharpened saws, if you have a tooth that's higher than the other, it's almost like putting the emergency brakes on when you're cutting. So you want all the teeth to be at the same level. Now there's a bunch of different, you can, a bunch of different kinds of saw teeth, I guess, you, know, you get the, how many saw teeth do you have? How, do you do, how would I describe this saw? And generally it's described by points per inch. I toothed this one and I know it's nine teeth per inch. Basically for every inch, if I line that inch mark up with the one tooth, I can count off nine teeth and it'll land at the end. That last point would land at the end. So that's called points per inch. And I mentioned you know, the different files are designed for different points per inch. And the idea is that we want half, the, this is a triangular shape file, 60 degrees in each corner. We want half the file to dip into the tooth, plus you know, have a little bit more extra, if that makes any sense. And the idea is that we'll have three edges and three faces that we can rotate our file and get a, a fresh face and edge every time when it gets dull. If it's too big, you're gonna waste like a middle section of the, We've got it fairly wide there. If we're going to waste a little bit of the file there, plus the radius is a bit more. And if it's too small, we're going to you know, burn up an entire face of the file and an edge if we're just working on one section. We not get optimized the use out of the file is a big thing. All right, so we've got our points per inch, and there's generally two different kinds of teeth on a saw file, or excuse me, on a saw. Some are designed to go with the grain, and some are designed to go across the grain. The ones that are designed to go with the grain are called rip saws, and the ones that are designed to go across the grain are called crosscut saws. Well, on a rip teeth, on a rip saws, we want our teeth to go straight across, so they're going to form a chisel edge. On a crosscut tooth, what we're going to do is we're going to file every other tooth at a different, what's called an angle called the fleam angle, and that's going to make create points on our teeth, and that'll just create like knife lines going down the, our tooth, the saw. We're gonna have two knives on each side of the saw plate, and then the tooth comes by and scoops it out. But these, these are both knives here that we're gonna form on the edge of the saw plate by creating a crosscut saw. And that's what we're gonna be filing today, by the way. We're gonna make a crosscut saw. Right, rip teeth are a little bit easier to file. Crosscut teeth aren't bad, they just take a little practice. Now, with rip teeth, We've got a couple of, basically only one angle we're really dealing with. You know, we've got our tooth line. Now it's kind of, how far back our tooth is laid back. It's called our rake angle. If our tooth is going straight up and down, it's called, basically you have a zero degrees of rake. It's zero degrees off of vertical. And as we relax that tooth back a little bit, the saws become a little less aggressive, easier to start, and it'll be a little bit, um, like I said, the big thing is just easier to start, and it'll be a little bit, um, but less aggressive is usually not an advantage, but, but it, as the tooth is straight up and down, it'll cut a little faster, and as we lay it back, it'll cut a little bit slower. And that's our rake angle. And we have, 
is going to go straight across, and that uh, straight across angle is what, the across angle rather is what we refer to as fleam angle. On a rip tooth, it's 90 degrees. Well, actually, it's zero degrees off. It's hard to say. Anyways, it's 90 degrees straight across the plate. And then on a crosscut saw, we're going to add what's called fleam. And as we go from 90 degrees, we're going to generally, it's about 20 to 25 degrees off of that 90. So we're going to create a 70 degree angle in there. And that will give us a 20 degree fleam angle. And we'll have some drawings of that in the resource section of the webpage as well, just help clarify things a little bit. So we got our rake angle, how far our tooth is laid back. And the, the more vertical it is, the more aggressive the cut, but the more difficult it is to start. And our crosscut saw, oh, oh, excuse me, rip saws are generally between like zero and eight degrees of rake. And our crosscut saws are generally between about eight degrees and 15 degrees of rake. So on a crosscut saw, the tooth is gonna be laid back a little further, but that's also gonna, you know, we're gonna create a knife edge by filing at a fleam angle as well. And what we're gonna do on a crosscut saw and rip saw for that matter, we file every other tooth and then we flip the saw around and then do the other teeth with the appropriate angles. Now for crosscut saws, I like to go ahead and set the teeth first. It gives me a visual reference of, first of all, which tooth I'm working on and how the angle should be. Because the general rule of thumb is you file the face of the tooth that's pointing away from you. Let me go ahead and set this up a little bit. Now I mentioned the sets a moment ago, and that's the tool we're gonna to use now. And there's various kinds. This is called a Stanley 52X, I believe. And this is one of my favorites. They're readily available, but they seem to be getting fairly pricey nowadays. But, um, and this is another one here. This is just a standard. Uh, these are available through several online retailers right now, and they work pretty well as well. Um, but my preference is the 52X. And that's the one I'm going to be doing, using today. So, oh, the one tool I didn't mention about earlier, magnification. It helps out tremendously to be able to see well. Magnification and good lighting. So I'm just going to get my saw set. And now I know this is set up because I've, I've already set it up. But we don't want to bend the teeth too much, but we want to bend them enough. And the idea is to bend each tooth out just uh, in, you know, about five thousandths per side, eight thousandths per side. And we're going to remove a little bit of that set. And the set depends on what you're cutting. If you're cutting soaking wet green wood, you want the teeth out, you know, a lot of set because it's going to come back and pinch on you. If you're sawing hardwoods, you know, those nice dry hardwoods, you can get away with a little bit less set. So basically the wood's going to tell you how much set you need. I generally saw mostly dry hardwoods. So about five thou per side is more than enough for me. Um, and I've got a set of calipers. You don't really need digital calipers to do this. You can generally just feel it and just see how the saw cuts. All right, just need to raise the saw plate up a little bit so I can get access to it with my saw, my saw set. What I want to do is just push every other tooth over towards that way. And then I'll eventually I'll flip the saw around and uh, get the other teeth going back the other way. And just keep working it down, paying attention to what you're doing. It's really easy to lose track of the tooth. So as I'm setting, before I release the, the set on the other tooth, I'm focusing on the next tooth that I need to aim for, if you will. So as I release that tooth, I know which tooth I'm aiming for. And this is a good time to cut off your cell phones and get a nice quiet place. It's easy to lose track of your teeth, just which one you're on. Right, just coming down the home stretch on this side of the saw, and what I'm going to do in a moment is after I finish getting the, every other tooth on this side, I'm going to flip the saw around and catch the teeth that I missed on the other side and push them back towards me now. All right, there's the last tooth. And I generally will keep track. So I, I, when I, I bent the last full tooth that way, and I'll know to come back and start on the second tooth when I come back the other way. Again, you got to keep track of those teeth. It's easy to lose track of them. And you can draw, I've seen people 
Sometimes it's helpful if you take a little Sharpie marker and put a little dot on the teeth that you need to bend over. Now on a nine point saw, it's not too bad. Uh, you can generally keep a track of those guys, but some of the dovetail saws that I make that are 15 points are really difficult to keep track of, especially if you're not accustomed to you know, training your eyes to focus on one side or the other. And I can't imagine some of those super fine, like 24 point saws that <laughs> they used to make. I mean, I'm not sure how in the world you set or sharpen those guys, but I've never found use for a saw with finer teeth than 15 points anyways, unless we're talking about hacksaws. And just work our way down. Again, you know, hit one tooth, then train your eyes on the next tooth that you want to catch, and then move your saw set to that position. And you want to really try to avoid mixing them up because it's not a good idea to bend the teeth back and forth. Some saw plates, you might break the tooth off immediately, and other ones, you're simply just going to weaken it. So once the saw teeth get set in one direction, that's pretty much where they need to stay for the rest of their life. Coming down to my last, my last bit of teeth on the other side, got three or four more to go. So I've already set the teeth, and some are pointing towards me, and I'm finishing up the ones that are pointing that way. And there we go. All right, everything looks good. Now it's actually time to start sharpening the saw. Um, so we mentioned rake angle, how far the teeth are facing back. So like on a cross cut, we're gonna go for about 12 degrees on ours. It's, I find it a good happy medium. You can go back to like 15 degrees. You know, between eight and 15 is a good cross cut number. And again, the steeper the tooth, the more aggressive the saw. I mean, the further it's laid back, the easier it is to start. That's really the big, you know, the compromise you have to make. Um, so we got to talk about rake angle, and we also have the fleam angle, which way the teeth are going to create those points. Now, on my saw vise, I've actually drawn in lines at my 20 degrees fleam. At least I think that, uh, yeah, I had set those up for 20 degrees. And that's also a good general fleam angle. Uh, anywhere between... You hear about some hybrid saws that have like 10 degrees of fleam and 10 degrees of rake, and those work well too. But we're gonna make a dedicated crosscut saw that's gonna hopefully really excel at crosscutting. So we're gonna go ahead and give it a little steeper fleam angle. So I've drawn 20 degree lines on my saw vise, and that's just gonna be a visual reference. So I can rotate my body here and start filing. And then I know, you know, maintain that consistent fleam angle. And then when I flip the saw around, I'll rotate my body the other way and file the other way. And it's just a really nice visual reference. Again, you can lay a, put a, some of my visual reference on the bench. All right. Now, the one thing about filing teeth is you want to try to maintain, this, get it as stiff as you can, if you will. If the saw plate's way up here as you're filing, all you're going to do is just make the saw plate vibrate back and forth. And it's going to drive your ears crazy. It's going to ruin your file, and you're not going to get a sharp tooth. So get it low in your vise. And there we go, all right. And just make sure I've got my angle gauge set up here. And you can do this without it, but when you're starting out, this is a really handy tool. So my goal is, remember I said I had the teeth point, you know, had every other tooth. Well, my goal is to file the face of the tooth that's pointing away from me. So I'm gonna look down here and find the first tooth that's pointing that way, and since this is the toe of a saw, and this is our heel. My left hand is the face of the tooth. So what I want to do is find the first tooth that's pointing away from me. And I'm going to take my file and put it on the face of that tooth and get my body lined up with the fleam angle. And just this is set, is, if I keep this vertical, or excuse me, horizontal, it maintains my rake angle of the file. If I rotate it, that's how you adjust this basically. I mean, I can adjust the angle here, but if I keep this horizontal, I know that my rake angle is consistent. So let's find that first tooth and line it up with the fleam angle, line my body up, and then just Find that first tooth that's pointing away from you. And 
And again, no, normally when you're just sharpening a saw, you don't need to take quite as many strokes. If you've got a good sharp file, here's taking about three strokes to get the teeth almost to the shape where I want them. And we're going to come back and fine tune these later anyways. We're just trying to get the teeth shaped at this point. And it will cut at this point. It'll probably cut pretty well, but we're eventually going to come back and actually joint the tops of the teeth and we're going to create little small flats on them. And that will be our last, our visual cue. Once we get rid of those flats, anything that reflects light on the top of the teeth is a dull spot. And so when we come back to our final sharpening, we're just going to kind of just kiss the teeth until those reflections just go away. We're going to get, you know, hit the tooth from one side, try to get rid of half the reflection, hit it from the other side, and that reflection should just go away. And then you get a perfectly sharp tooth on the top. So let's continue on. We're we'll continue shaping our teeth. And we're just finishing up the first side of the saw, and we're going to come back and flip it around the other way and file the other teeth. All right, side one's done, and we're just going to flip the saw around. Right, so you catch the other teeth going the other way. Now here, you're gonna have to change everything up. Um, so we we're filing with our fleam that way. Now we're gonna fleam is gonna be going that way. And also, since we've turned the saw plate around, our rake is now instead of being folded back that way, it's gonna be slightly back that way, about 12 degrees. So we'll readjust our filing guide accordingly. All right, so that's set, and actually, you know, I prefer to, going in this direction, I prefer to go from the heel to the toe. It's just a more natural, whatever is comfortable for you, you'll get into a rhythm. And we're going to try to find the face of the tooth that's pointing away from us. And there we go, we have that, let me tighten that vise up. Again, you clamp it down nice and tight because vibration is your enemy on this one. And we're just going to keep that horizontal. We've got a rake set. Our flame is now going the other way. And we're just going to give that about two strokes. And at this point, I can really start seeing the knife edges starting to develop. You know, I don't consider it sharp at this point. I'm still shaping the teeth but it's starting to look like a sharpened saw. And there we about messed up there. Just pay attention to what you're doing. And we're coming down the home stretch here, just a few more teeth on this side. There we go. Um, at this point, we're probably 95% there. Uh, I can sight down the saw plate. All my teeth are still nice and in line. I haven't filed too many too low or anything. Uh, all the teeth feel pretty sharp, but we can make it just a little bit better. Because um, like I said, we basically shaped the teeth and they're pretty close to being sharp. But what we're gonna do now is take the jointer and just lightly dust the tops. And the idea there is to give me a visual reference. First of all, we want all the teeth to be at the same height. And also the shiny top will give me a visual reference when to stop filing. So I'm going to try to file half that shine away from one side of the tooth and then the other half of the reflection away. And right when that reflection disappears, my tooth should be at the perfect height and as sharp as it's going to be. So let's go ahead and get set up for jointing. And like I said, this is just a light dusting. If, you know, if it was an old beat up saw, you might have to do some really heavy uh, jointing. But here, we know we're pretty close already. I just want a visual reference. So when I come back and do the final sharpening, it'll be spot on. All right, and I generally work from heel to toe, just because that's the way the teeth are flowing. 
And just with a jointer, just make sure that the edge is at 90 degrees to it and just give it a... And what I'm looking for is just to see that all the teeth have just a little bit of reflection on them. So I'm gonna give it one more light pass. There we go. Just two passes all it did. And right now we've got just a little bit of reflection on the tops of the teeth. I'll go ahead and get this set back up in the vise so we can file the rest of those guys away. And like I said, now I've got a visual cue to know when my teeth are the right height and when they're, they're as sharp as they can be. And generally when I'm sharpening at home, I don't have all the studio lighting. So I'll generally put like a little small lamp or something, a little gooseneck lamp right over top of my teeth. You know, I'll get a lot better shot of the reflection. Um, and I'll adjust that around all the time. Just so good lighting is essential. Not everybody has studio lighting, so this is really helpful. And the same thing we were doing before with the shaping, but I'm going to look at the reflection, you know, and just judge, make a quick judgment on how big it is. And my goal is to get rid of half of that reflection. And so that might take a full stroke to get rid of that part. This one over here might just take a half a stroke. And just make a judgment judgment call on how big the reflection is. You don't have to go a full stroke every time. You don't have to go one stroke. You might have to go two. Um, sometimes when, in my final sharpening phases, I might just go like two little short strokes, depending on how big that flat is. Like that one's probably about three there. That one's almost nothing. And this for a little bit of practice, time on task, you'll get a better feel for how much to remove. And a little more. So that one took down quite a bit. So again, I'm finding the face of the tooth that's pointing away from me. And when we come back in the other direction, we're going to get the last half of that reflection, that little flat top. Because we're going through the, this way on one side and then we're going to finish up the other, on the other tooth. All right, so where were we? There we go, that guy. That guy didn't need much at all. This might need uh, about a full stroke. Nope, a little more. So, and you'll get into a rhythm. Just kind of, just remember your goal is to get rid of half the flat. We finally got our saw plate all sharpened and I'm satisfied with the, the teeth. I can feel, if you just fairly, if, if a, the teeth grab your finger, you can just feel it kind of pricking your finger. Obviously you don't want to slide it across there, but you can tell whether it's sharp just when it grabs your finger a little bit. So we've got our saw plate polished, sharpened, ready to go. Our handle, the front of it's nice and dry now, so we can go and this is our final assembly here. And in just a moment, we're actually gonna have a saw that hopefully will cut nicely. And if it doesn't, we're gonna, after we take our test cut, I'll walk you through a few of the things that you may wanna to try to help tune things up a little bit. All right, we got one there. And I'll go ahead and get one saw nut set in there and then we can wiggle and twist it as we need to. And sometimes you may have to open these holes up a little bit in case you got off a little bit when you're punching or drilling. The one thing I do encourage you to do is never just drive it through with a hammer. Now I'm gonna gently tap it a little bit just to help seat it. But at this point, if we drove that, the screw through the steel, you might strip all the teeth off of it. So just once you get it through, you can kind of give it a little gentle nudge, but you don't wanna drive it through. And we'll, I'm not gonna fully set this quite yet, but. Pull it through a little bit. 
And then I'll try to get the other two holes aligned. Now remember, you get a sharp saw now, so be care extra careful. There we go. And that one fit nice. So that was the way I like for them to just kind of pop right into place. But that is not always going to happen. There we go. Right. And remember, when you drive it home with a split nut driver, they'll suck the suck it the rest of the way through. But I do want to make sure that the, the squares line up so we don't get those crisscrossed. Come on. Now, brass is a soft material, so when you're driving the screws home, be gentle. Make sure you've got the screwdriver tip completely engaged. Also, you want to make sure that the screwdriver tip actually fits. Um, I personally make my own split nut drivers to fit my slots. I know I have like a 50 thou slot on the screws that I make, so I make sure that my screwdriver tip has the same size slot, and it's not a wedge shape, it's more of a rounded shape on there so it actually grabs at the bottom of the slot and i'm just going to snug them up and as time goes by this they will shrink a little bit and your saw plate will move around a little bit so you may need to tighten the saw nuts up a little bit later on but right now our goal is just to kind of get it together and make a test cut and makes any tune it up however we need to There we go. All right, the moment of truth. I've drawn a line across the edge here. Oh, and that's what the saw is looking like so far. Looking pretty good. Got a nice straight edge here, and let's take it for a test drive. Nope. She is definitely tracking a little bit to the right. I got off on the line a little bit, so she's tracking a bit to the right. And what that means is I've got more set on the right-hand side of the, the plate. So I've got this cutting more wood over here, and the saw is wanting to go that way a little bit. And there's easy correction for that. You just lay it on a fairly flat, it, flat surface. And generally, it only takes like one, maybe two strokes with a stone to get the correction taken care of. So don't go nuts, just I'm going to try one pass, make another cut and see what we look like. Oh, I lied to you, pass and a half. All right, uh, let me draw another straight line just so we'll have a, a good reference. I'd call that acceptable. The off plum is bad sawing, but it didn't spelch out much at the bottom. Nice crisp cut. It followed the line. I think we're good to go. Um, now I could probably make it just a wee bit sharper. Now I stoned this side once already. If I just wanted just a real light dressing on one on both sides now, just to knock off any bird that might be on there. And that, believe it or not, just those two strokes with a, you know, it's a fairly fine diamond stone there will make a big difference. And I would like to make one more test cut just to see how we're doing. And this bench is a little bit high, so I mean, my plum might not be right, but. As long as I can track the line straight across this way, we should be good. Right, I'm pleased with that. It works well. Now the last thing we need to do is flush the saw nuts to the surface of the handle and put a finish on it. And we'll call it a saw.